ways and uh, you know and you know fifteen percent of the world's population at any, any given time living with with a disability likely more um uh the, the, the you know it's it's extremely important so you know this session is one that, that we have actually done done before at igf uh and the intent is to explore innovative uses of icts for the empowerment of persons with disabilities um enhance awareness of what is already possible and and, and also explore what's coming down the pipeline um, there's a more lengthy description that you can find on the website for for this panel that will give you a little bit more info if you'd like but our expected outcomes uh here are to help under help it raise awareness understanding of how universal design principles for accessibility can be advanced across the internet to capture and understand uses of icts enabled by the internet that are today empowering persons with disabilities to to talk about what the igf community can do what action can be taken and where cross sectoral collaboration can and should occur to improve the experience of those with disabilities and to um, ensure appreciation of the of of a diversity of perspectives um, uh, from all of our all of our panelists so uh, very very briefly i i uh, format wise I think for this panel, um, I've already knocked out of the intro and saying hello for myself and my organization. But um, uh, briefly, I'll I'll just introduce our <clears throat> speakers, just their name and org, and leave it leave it to each of them as we uh, t talk in turn with opening remarks uh, to to give you in you know uh, some some explanation about who they are and what they're where they where they are coming from. Uh, and and uh, and and to share some opening remarks, and then we have uh, we have questions, <laughs> but we want your engagement. That's what this panel is. That's what makes this panel so valuable and, and helpful, I think, to the IGF community. So please do share those questions. Um, we are you. Um, uh, looks like okay. Uh, using the chat. We'll monitor the chat. <laughs> Was checking to see if we had a Q and A function. Oh gosh, sorry. Um, and uh, uh, but we have uh, lots of questions to ask to all the panelists, and in and ones for uh, d directed at each of the panelists as well. So um, very very briefly. Uh, first, George Manique uh, is uh, uh, our uh, first. Uh, speaker, um, Ganella Esprink, uh, Betsy Perler, and Judy Okite. Uh, so, uh, and, and Ricardo Garcia Bahmanda as well. Um, uh, apologies there. Um, I, uh, I, I would love for you all to, to uh, we'll, we'll go in order with uh, George first, I think, uh, uh, and, and uh, to, to provide some opening remarks, and then we can. Um, uh, we can uh, uh, move to to questions and and hopefully have a, a great dialogue with the community here. Uh, go ahead. Hey Brian, looks like oh yes, looks like George is having some trouble in Ganella oh, no. actually logging in. So. Okay, yeah, we can come back to him. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Yeah, uh, Ganella, you want to go ahead? Ganella is also having trouble logging in. I'm troubleshooting with her right now. So let's go oh, ahead no. and go to the, to the folks <laughs> in the room first. Let's go to uh, Judy first. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Judy Okite uh, from Nairobi, Kenya. Equality and equality, uh, where we advocate for accessibility um, to online um, content data or and offline that is um, regarding access to, to physical spaces and also um, as, as far as sign language is concerned and all that. Um, it's a pleasure um, to be here and thank you, uh, Matthew, for inviting me. Thank you. I'm Betsy Furler. I'm from Houston, Texas in the United States and I am the founder and CEO of an organization called For All Abilities. We use a software 
to help employers support their employees with all sorts of disabilities, differences, and um, we're passionate about not forcing disclosure of a disability or a difference in order to get support. And my area of expertise is in cognitive accessibility. I'm a speech pathologist or speech therapist by training. So that's it for the room, Brian. Why don't we go to Ricardo, okay. Ricardo next? We'll go to, okay, got it. Great. Go ahead, please, Ricardo. Go ahead. Yeah, good morning. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yep, sounds okay, good. Okay, good morning from, from here, from Madrid, Spain. Uh, Ricardo Garcia Belmonde. I'm, um, I'm an ITU uh, consultant. I've been working or uh, collaborating with ITU for years. And I also have another hat as uh, head of accessibility, uh, head of accessibility and digital inclusion at uh, Atos for the Iberia region. Uh, I've been involved in uh, in uh, in the field of accessibility and the inclusion for, for, for persons with disabilities since uh, 2004. So it's been quite a few years, and I keep learning uh, about this matter every single day. And um, my background is an, as an economist. I have a master's degree in economy by the uh, Universidad Complutense of uh, Madrid. And um, really appreciate, I'm very, very thankful for, for the invitation, for being part of uh, being able to participate in, in this in this panel and in this event. So i um, very excited and looking forward to the discussion. Brian, you're muted. I do it every time. I apologize for that. <laughs> I was going to say, excellent. Thank you so much. When uh, when George and Ganella are able to go, and we can certainly uh, come back to them. Uh, but uh, you know, this is uh, again intended to be a dialogue uh, with you all. And um, uh, you know, and and and, uh, and and we'd like for this to be like an intimate, uh, interactive conversation <laughs> with all of you in the community um so uh you know just to start to start us off though we have some i think some uh rather open-ended questions but hopefully get get you all out there in the community uh, uh thinking thinking about maybe specific things you want to ask interventions you want to make etc um two uh betsy judy ricardo would love to hear from all of you just generally about what what the state of accessibility is from your experience in your region perhaps how does it compare uh with other regions or globally um uh ict accessibility so you say who gets started <laughs> <laughs> go ahead why don't you go ahead <laughs> Okay, thank you. I'll take the floor. So, so uh, yeah. So um, in Spain, there's been a there's been a, a legal framework for for many years actually, uh, and uh, right now we are mainly even even though we have the um, <clears throat> our own let's say a, a national framework for years, we're basically under the EU um, uh, regulatory framework. So there's two main um, there's two main uh, um, directives that apply in the EU space in the European Union space that I would highlight. Those are the uh, Web Accessibility Directive that came into force in in 2000 in 2016, and uh, that applies to every single everything that's digital in public sector. Applies to all websites and mobile apps. Uh, that uh, the public sector, public sector entities use or uh, put at the disposal of the public, of the general public, of all citizens, and that that has a lot of implications in terms of uh, public procurement, of course, right? Because they this this <clears throat> this uh, directive that has been transposed to every single national uh, legal framework, of course. Uh, considers that or contemplates that, uh, of course, public sector when procuring from private sector 
everything the web everything app everything digital that they procure of course needs to meet the uh, standard the en301549 so this was really important uh, back in the day and now uh, just this year the european accessibility act was passed so uh, it's being transposed to the national legislations of each eu member and it will uh, enter it fully into force in 25 so this means and this one affects the private sector as a measure to uh, for market harmonization not so much uh, around human rights but it's like the other it's like working on the other end so we've got two these two like legal forces working on you know from different angles but so all both of them aiming at the same thing right so this is we're hoping that this is going to be a really really important because this will mean that if you basically if you want to sell your products or services in the EU space, you're going to need to meet the uh, the accessibility standards. So uh, we're, you know, we're excited and we're looking forward to see how this whole thing unfolds, right? So the in this sense, the legal framework is pretty strong. And uh, obviously, like just like in every other country, uh, uh, the, there is a need, I would think, for stronger enforcement mechanisms. Excellent. Thank you. And I see Ganelli you made it on. Uh, excellent. Welcome. Um, I had just asked the uh, one of the sort of our, our opening question, which was, uh, you know, asking any any uh, anyone to to weigh in on the state of accessibility from your experience in your region, et cetera. Uh, but uh, it'd be great for you to, to briefly, uh, you know, introduce yourself to <laughs> uh, uh, before if if. Uh, you want to go now, or 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 I know Betsy or 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 Judy could could also go, but oh, do we not have audio? We can know. No. <laughs> oh, no, there you go. <laughs> Great. And, uh, thank you very much for the introduction, and my apologies for being late. There were a few little login issues I had to deal with, and uh, yeah, look, happy to be here, and. Uh, um, because I missed the beginnings, I'm, I'm not sure if I'll be repeating myself or not, but uh, um, it's actually a good timing because uh, today is the 1st of December and the 3rd of December, uh, as we probably all know, is um, the International Day of Persons with Disability. And the theme this year is um, not all disabilities are visible. And I think that's important to remember because we we always uh, talk about uh, persons who have vision impairment, hearing loss, physical disability, and they make a, a big difference to accessibility in, in terms of what we need to do. But when it comes to invisible disability, for example, uh, people who might have cognitive disabilities, uh, um, learning disabilities, autism, uh, acquired brain injury, there are particular accessibility um, issues that come up that we need to consider. And, and that relates mm -hmm. to use of friendly sites, um, apps, uh, intuitive design, um, good navigation, um, content that is easy to follow, etc. So all of those things we need to um, be concerned about and certainly uh, pay attention to this year um, and, and all ongoing. Um, I'm glad Ricardo discussed the, uh, uh, the issue of the web um, accessibility directive and the accessibility act in the EU they really have potential for global um, global effect and um, I'm just going to mention that if anyone is interested there is a webinar that um, the Internet Society um, Accessibility Standing Group uh, with Klaus Huckner of Austria is giving on the 5th of December at 12 UTC. So nothing like a plug. But uh, that will go into a lot of detail exactly what the implications are of that directive. And, and I think we can all benefit from further information about that. 
Um, I just wanted to mention um, another point um, to start off with in regard to um, we always um, hear about big tech and a, a lot of issues, but we also need to think about companies like Google, Apple, Microsoft, uh, who have been innovators uh, in uh, particular services um, that really have had a huge impact on persons with disability. And uh, those corporations uh, um, happen to be um, signed on uh, to what's called the Valuable 500, which is um, um, a group of uh, 500 CEOs of major corporations uh, globally that, uh, that have decided, pledged that they are going to work towards making a difference on accessibility and a range of different types of services for persons with disabilities. So um, keep that in mind and, uh, and whether you are small or large, we can all make a difference to improve accessibility. Thank you. Thank you so much. Excellent. Um, uh, Betsy, do you wanna go next? <laughs> Sure. So um, in the U.S., I feel like um, the, well, the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed in 1990. So we have had a law around accessibility for quite a few years now. And I believe that most people in the U.S. still focus very heavily on um, hearing, vision, and mobility issues. Although we have made very good progress um, in those areas, there's still, there's still a ways to go. Um, but we have made progress in those areas. Um, cognitive accessibility is often left out of the conversation in the US from my um, professional um, experience, both at conferences, even conferences on accessibility and disability, it's often left out of the conversation. And when I sp speak to employers, they often tell me that they don't have any employees with disabilities, as we all know is almost universally not the truth. And what is often left out are those people with cognitive accessibility issues, and that's really 100% of us because we all think, work, and learn differently throughout our lifetime, our weeks, and even our days, whether we're jet lagged because we're in a different time zone. I know I'm nine hours different here um, than I am at home. That definitely affects my cognitive skills. Um, people who have had COVID and have long COVID symptoms are also going to be affected cognitively for quite a while. Um, so I feel like that in the United States, we're still really um, not addressing those issues. And <laughs> I, thanks, Betsy. And you know, just for just to take my moderator hat off for a second there too, I, w I would. Uh, you go i would personally go even even further to you know you, you you make a it's it's a powerful point that you make there about the year that the americans with disabilities act was adopted and uh since that time especially in the last few years there I has been uh, oh, here we go um there there's okay. been a there's been some struggles <laughs> in applying it to new internet-based modalities, um, which does beg um, Hi, perhaps a, a policy update. Uh, sorry, is, am, I com am I coming through okay? Yeah, Brian, we're just getting a little bit of feedback in the room. I think the audio folks are, oh, are working on it. Understood. But yeah, we're no problem. It on our end, no problem at all. Well. Okay. Well, uh, perhaps I, I think. Uh, hey, uh, Brian. Judy, which, yes. Yeah, yeah. Judy wanted to make an intervention here. Sorry. Uh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. And yeah, I was just telling Matthew that uh, Gunella did not introduce himself, herself. So some of us uh, do not really know her. Gunella, you, you, you will need to do that. Uh, but just to catch on to um, where we are in Kenya, um, we had the ICT 
um, national policy that was reviewed in the year 2006. Um, and the intention to review it was that it can align with the, with the agenda 2030 for Kenya and also the new constitution. I mean, a few things um, needed to be put in place. And so it, it focuses on um, four main objectives. And so that is the market that is, um, uh, we are talking about uh, training, we are talking about uh, inclusivity. And so when, the, when we look at the, the inclusivity bit about it, um, in 2020, there is um, the National ICT guideline that was gazetted in, in, in the year 2020. And that was uh, primarily to break down the policy and on implementation phases, who is supposed to do what, uh, because um, we find that there are very many, um, when it comes to the ICT um, in Kenya, there is the ministry, there is the authority, there is the regulator. And so um, the guideline um, stipulates who is meant to do what because there was always a confusion and so the implementation would, would remain hanging because nobody knows um, exactly who, who is supposed to do that. So, um, so, so that is ongoing, so that's what happened in 2020 and then um, last year, uh, sorry, this year in the month of May, um, Kenya published its first um, ICT accessibility standard for products and services. I think um, we are the first in Africa. And so um, it's still, the standard is still at, at its infancy. And so um, we are still trying to find around um, how that is supposed to work. Uh, looking at that standards are normally voluntary. So we have to work away around to find how do we enforce that and ensure that the products and services have to be um, accessible. So we hope that um, the rest of the continent is going to be coming for us, to us rather for benchmarking and it's not going to be the other way that another country is going to pick it up and begin implementing before we do that. So that is my opening remarks, thank you. Thanks. Much appreciated. Um, and and uh, I, I do see Vanilla uh, provided some background info on herself in the chat too. That, that helps. Thank you very much for that. So uh, you know the next the next question I had, and, and not not every, everyone needs to answer this, but all of you are certainly welcome to. Another one that maybe a little thought provoking. Very curious too about uh, what you folks in the audience think about this. But how has the pandemic affected the uptake, the development of ICTs um, in your region, in your experience? Uh, what are the lessons that we may have been able to learn from this as they relate to accessibility? You know, it, I've, some some people have have, have framed have framed, uh, if you're looking for a silver lining, as they say, you're looking for the positives in a, in a lot of negatives and a pandemic is a lot of, uh, uh, almost entire, entirely negative, right? But um, if you're looking for some of the positives or the, the, the secondary impacts that might have some value, you could argue that um, in some cases, the pandemic has uh, accelerated digitization across a number of sectors, namely the healthcare sector across different markets. And I'm curious if if uh, there's a noticeable impact on accessibility in your experience. Anyway, uh, that's not a question directed to any specific panelists, but I would love for any any panelists to uh, to weigh in anything they've observed or trends or anything like that they'd like to, to share. I'm coming from the private sector um, and I can definitely tell you that the pandemic made uh, had a major impact on the accessibility issues of most people um, with or without disabilities. Um, I know the aging population um, has really struggled through the pandemic um, due to internet accessibility issues, whether that's access to the internet um, or 
access around accessibility issues once they have they have the access. Um, even in a town like Houston, Texas, a very, very large city, um, we have a, a part of our population that doesn't have access to adequate internet. And during the pandemic, that meant they weren't getting the health care that they needed. Um, children weren't getting the education that they needed. And it is shocking when you see a city like Houston having those issues. I also feel um, that the virus, the, the COVID virus itself and the long-term effects of that are also going to kind of compound the problems that we've, we've already been seeing. So I think the pandemic has um, probably done kind of, you know, two things, two counteracting things in that area. One, causing more people to have accessibility issues and then also providing access and more um, understanding around the need for access to the internet. Just to weigh in um, from what Betsy uh, has just said, um, the pandemic uh, brought in, a can I say positive for us? Because uh, accessibility issues are things that we have been um, making noise about for quite a while, but when uh, the pandemic got here and then everyone realized that the services and uh, products are going online, then how many people are actually going to be able to access them? Now that accelerated it. And so it was, um, it was very interesting to see um, the, the legal the legal fraternity, you know, coming to the front and and beginning to um, bring these issues to the forefront. Um, I think the year 2021 20, and very early in 2022, we had a lot of awareness of um, accessibility issues being brought to the fore, fore. And so I'm just hoping it wasn't a hype, that it's something that uh, is going to move forward after that because now that becomes another issue that this is the hottest thing so we can talk about it and then uh, what's the next hottest so we hope you're not going to be left in limbo great thanks <laughs> <clears throat> somebody else about to speak okay yeah. oh yes please go ahead yeah, that then um, um, you know, like piggybacking on, on what uh, it's been just just mentioned. Yeah, I think I think uh, the uh, pandemic well, we've seen it pretty much everywhere has meant an expansion, an explosion of digital. Just think of how many people had never used this the tool that we're using at this moment, Zoom, or other similar video conferencing tools like Teams or many others. Many people are not familiar with these, right? So um, <clears throat> lockdown, many people having to uh, work from home and having to use these tools on a daily basis and many others. So if anything, the uh, pandemic has meant two things. One, uh, an explosion of digital in many aspects and many uh, businesses, organizations that uh, were relying on analogic have been swept away, have disappeared. Right, we've seen that um, pretty much everywhere. But the, on the other hand, with this expansion of digital uh, has meant that the uh, uptake of accessibility hasn't kept uh, up, uh, the pace, of course. And that's easy to see I mean, in the last few years, but now it's exponential. Uh, if you do a, just a simple search of uh, in Google Trends and you search for digital transformation, for example, th that term as compared to digital accessibility or web accessibility, the gap is huge in both, you know, between both curves. This is not scientific, of course, but that tells you something, right? The, the degree of interest shown, you know, in, in just in Google searches, how do I take on a digital? How do I take on accessibility, right? But at the same time, <clears throat> I think this is an opportunity. Uh, because many of the issues that uh, hadn't been uh, addressed uh, years ago, now they become evident. They've been uh, brought up to the surface, 
and uh, they just can't be ignored anymore, any any longer. Right. Uh, the problem is that during the uh, pandemic, uh, we were all in a in a, an emergency situation, <clears throat> and uh, this is a critical aspect. Emergency situ emergency situation or emergency communication systems are critical in many different situations, like like natural disasters. That's what we think of. Now, this was a different one. This is a global pandemic, and uh, many people uh, were blocked from receiving the information and were being you know being able to communicate with the the authorities or <clears throat> people in charge. People that could provide, you know, services, vital services, or just basic services. So uh, we've seen an issue there, huge, huge issue in, in many, many countries. And uh, and the, on the other hand, that has been brought to the attention of the authorities. So we're looking forward to seeing change, positive changes in 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 that uh, in that respect in the next uh, in few years or or immediate ones, actually. Excellent. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, um, you know, there's um, a couple of questions and, and, and just for, for folks either either in the room uh, you know, or uh, or really for those uh, for, uh, in the audience participating digitally, uh, you know, we're, we're just continuing to monitor for, for questions, et cetera, interventions you might want to make. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, there were, you know, towards towards some solutions, some constructs, some fora that that are that are out there today, where you out there in the community can get involved. Um, uh, you know, I think our panelists are pretty are 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 as you I think you can tell our experts, but our leaders in some of these fora. Now, one of them, Ganella, if it's okay, I could could ask you to maybe elaborate a little bit about. ISOC accessibility standing gr uh, group, uh, uh, and and perhaps um, uh, you know I, I I know that in 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 the lead up to this panel we had talked about about accessibility in in uh, government procurement and how that can have a wider effect as well. Uh, those may kind of be two different points, but they're probably also related. But it, 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 could I throw it to you to maybe uh, uh, raise awareness about the accessibility standing group and sure yes Great. thank you uh, so the accessibility standing group uh, uh, is is relatively new it um, it was formulated earlier this year but it uh, it came out of a um, an isoc as in internet society special interest group and before that a chapter on uh, special needs and disability which has been operating so it's been operating in one way or another over over many years and um, it's it's really designed to promote digital inclusion for persons with disability and uh, and hopefully one day we won't need to talk about this it will just be a given wouldn't that be incredible but unfortunately we've got a long way to go and uh, and so we're working uh, first of all um, with an internet society internal accessibility working group uh, on a number of measures that the organization itself is taking to to be more accessible which is um, looking very promising and uh, we have um, created awareness uh, by running webinars and um, I did plug for a webinar on the um, EU Web Accessibility Directive and the um, European Accessibility Act uh, before we are also going to have uh, webinars uh, generally um, in various parts of the world, uh, one in Fiji, one in Bangladesh, uh, and, um, and obviously the one uh, that I mentioned in Austria. So um, we are looking also at doing um, a, a social media campaign about the importance of accessibility for business and, um, and how it can actually benefit business and it all ties in really with this um, um, aspect of uh, accessible uh, features in public procurement 
and and those European regulations, um, legislations that's coming in. So um, if if companies are going to supply uh, their services, uh, then they really do need to make sure that they are accessible. So that that's really what it comes down to. Uh, so apart from that, though, I really want to talk about the importance of persons with disability uh, like us uh, raising awareness, advocating for accessibility, usability, use of friendly um, services across the board. But we need more voices. There's not enough of us. And so we fortunately were able to link in with the Asia Pacific School of Internet Governance to run um, capacity building workshops, uh, one in Bangladesh on uh, on this topic. So disability advocates could learn more about internet governance and from there be able to speak out in their own countries and train others in their own countries to do so. Um, we're working on a uh, an online course on disability leadership in internet governance and in uh, digital rights, and uh, and I think that that's just hot off the press, really. That's um, just being started in terms of uh, developing the content, so it won't be available for uh, quite some time, but. Uh, to have uh, a large number of people uh, with disability to speak from their own lived experience of disability is really important. It does make a difference when you have a blind person um, explaining why they can't access a particular website or an app or a, a particular online tool because it, it just doesn't work for them and they can demonstrate that. The same applies with a person with a hearing loss and I could continue. So, uh, so that's what we're aiming to do and, uh, and there's a lot of other things in the pipeline but I'll stop there, thank you. Did it again, sorry. <laughs> that's great, thank you so much. You know, one thing you mentioned, Ganel, which I I was uh, separately in, uh, in several, several uh, of the last panels that various events I've uh, uh, related to accessibility that I've been on, this has come up, is, is that for the private sector, for a business, there's a strong case for, you know, for embracing uh, accessibility by design. Uh, uh, a, a business case, uh, I, I think, which uh, maybe, which I, I wonder if I, 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 or I guess I struggle with because I, I feel like from the private sector, there's like a perception that it's, it's like legal requirements that are punitive or something like that. When um, not only is it the right thing to do, but just from a, a, from a business development perspective, um, ignoring accessibility in the design of in the design of, of, of an ICT um, is effectively excluding customers. And I've always, I, I, I've, uh, we, we, we try, I try to try to emphasize that a lot. Um, and uh, I, I, I guess it seems like an understated uh, incentive to me, but that's just me throwing in a opinion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And if I can continue on that line, um, it really is um, so important for business to do that. It's 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 not only um, a good thing to do, uh, but it's actually creating creating revenue. And there's been a few studies that show that, um, say in the in the US, with billions of billions of dollars could be lost if if a business um, doesn't make the services available. People will go elsewhere, and not only the person with a disability, but their family and friends, and and it all it all works against the business if they are not considering disability, and 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 so yeah, just makes good business sense. Agree, <laughs> and maybe this is a, a good bridge, uh, Ricardo, if it's okay, because um, I I realize you 
you know, you have a a, a, a report coming soon uh, about accessibility, digital inclusion within job recruitment in the hiring context, and um, uh, perhaps that 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 uh, you know the, the incentives of the business environment are, is something of a bridge to that. I'd, that that's another I think important development for the IGF community to to learn about it. Is it okay for you to? Share a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. So, um, um, in the uh, last uh, couple of years, I think uh, um, uh, through the, uh, the uh, collaboration with with ITU, uh, we've been working on <clears throat> we've been working on 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 a couple of things that have to do with improving um, improving the. Uh, hiring processes, the recruitment processes, making them more accessible and inclusive in um, in different fields and in, in the EU sphere, in the United Nations sphere in the first place, but then in other organizations. So we uh, actually looked into um, <clears throat> how the uh, some uh, the web uh, web portal uh, job portals look like, what they look like in terms of accessibility. And uh, we found a uh, bunch of uh, you know issues that were that were taking place pretty much across the board and um <clears throat> that have to do with things like um i don't know well for example when we're filling out a form you know uh, you know and applying to a to a job so many forms are are not labeled or they don't indicate the uh, the information that needs to be entered or uh, some fields that are fields that are mandatory or not indicated on they're only indicated through a visual you know asterisk but not uh, labeled programmatically or th things of uh, elements that have that can only be selected through a mouse by mouse clicking obviously that process issues to many users many images that were not uh, described you didn't have alternative descriptions all sorts of, of issues with with and inaccessible PDF documents with instructions on how to fill out a form or how to go about, you know, uh, applying to a to a specific job, et cetera. Right. So all kinds of, of issues that we that we see across the board, <clears throat> and also usability barriers. Right. So it's not only about um, how things are not being done correctly, you know, from a programmatic standpoint, but also from a usability standpoint. So uh, we collected all those findings and um, and uh, we started working, as I said a couple of years ago, in in, in a guide that uh, may um, you know may, may build in on, on these not only on these findings but on best practices that we'd like to reflect in recommendations uh, on how to improve these uh, these uh, pr uh, recruitment processes in general, but the, the accessibility of uh, job portals. <laughs> And uh, and this guide will be coming out uh, in the next few uh, weeks, hopefully. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, but but I'll, I'll let uh, some of the ITU people in the room to probably talk more about that if, if that's pertinent. Uh, I will mention that uh, in this in this um, the whole research that uh, that we did. Uh, we highlighted the role, and I and I know uh, um, that we may be talking about this sometime later in the uh, in the conversation, Brian. But uh, we highlighted the the role of artificial intelligence in uh, in recruitment processes, because as we know, uh, there are many um, AI powered algorithms are being used in uh, in procurement pro in recruitment processes. Right. For, for example, when, during interviews or um, when screening through um, thousands of uh, resumes or it's curricula, right, that the that, that organizations that employers receive for a specific position. So that's uh, it's uh, there's uh, there's a lot of really strong, uh, robust research out there um, <clears throat> saying that uh, there is risks around using AI for this kind of thing. And there is a specifically a report on access on artificial intelligence by the United Nations Special Rapporteur on, on Disability Rights with recommendations on how to avoid 
this uh, discriminatory use of, of AI that has been proven also with, with recommendations on what organizations should do and also regarding the, the uh, national policies that should be put in place and legal framework in order to avoid this kind of discrimination that's that's already happening. Right? So as I said, <clears throat> this this report is going to be a, a, a or this guide, actually, this this guide or guidebook is going to be pretty comprehensive with um, recommendations around how to make all these processes much more um, inclusive and, and, and accessible, of course. And um, and it's going to also include resources, a ton of resources, hopefully, or around accessibility in general, how to create accessible content and, and so forth. So, um, yeah, excited about that and uh, really looking forward because we think it's going to be a very, very useful uh, it's going to be a really useful uh, resource for for many um, stakeholders out there. Excellent, thank you. And and that's also probably a good. I see you have your your hand up, Betsy. But uh, but you know, I know for for all abilities works on make helping businesses become more inclusive internally in their pro own processes, as well as um, their extern I guess external facing how they would deal with customers, etc. Um, so, uh, curious about your perspectives here. Uh, what kind of uh, priorities you might advocate for to provide a level playing field for innovative technologies and processes? Yes. So, thank you, Brian. Um, I just want to first reiterate the business case for accessibility, not just for people with a diagnosed disability or a disability that they're willing to disclose, but for um, being able to reach all of your users or all of your employees, um, especially with a case of employers and employees. Um, most people, even people with a visible disability, don't want to disclose that disability at the beginning of their um, application process for a job. And that can cause all sorts of issues around forced disclosure if you have to disclose the disability to get the access to, for instance, just the application. Um, and it ends up being a very discriminatory practice. Um, also, the usability is so important for accessibility because, as I stated earlier, we all have cognitive changes throughout our even our week or our day. And as your product in, and your communication is more accessible for people with disabilities, it's also more accessible for every other user in your organization or in you know, the, your customers or whoever's using the product. Um, it is so important just to, it's just good business. I, I want people to do it because it's the right thing to do and but it also makes a very good business case to make all your all products accessible. I wanted to just very quickly run through because I think especially on cognitive accessibility, um, there's a lot of mystery around it and people consider it to be expensive or it's the unknown and it's scary. And so I have, I love alliteration. So I have the four V's of cognitive accessibility it's vanilla, visual, variety, and value. Um, vanilla is a term that we use in the US to say that something's kind of plain or bland, um, maybe uninteresting. And that oft often helps accessibility because when you have too many visuals, too much text, and not enough white space, it's very difficult from an accessibility standpoint. Um, so just by keeping that in mind is helpful. Um, visual colors matter. It matters. Um, there's, you know, issues around color blindness as well, but also there are issues around if you have a um, something that means go, and you color that red universally, that makes no sense. And you wouldn't believe how many times I've consulted with companies who have made that very mistake. So you want to think about colors matter. Um, just you want to minimize distractions, focus users' attention on the most important content, and use a lot of white space. Variety, you want to think about a variety of learning styles. That helps accessibility because if you're thinking about audio, visual, um, 
maybe even um, hands-on learning if we're talking off of, off of computer technology. Um, that's very important. Decreasing the complexity of the language helps everyone, um, and especially when you have um, people who may not speak the language, may not be their first language, um, that they're navigating it. Um, also, people with cognitive disabilities, limiting the language helps. It also helps from a hearing standpoint. And then value. Make sure you value all of your users and also use content, only the content that adds value, not content to fill spaces. Um, and so I think those four simple things, the four Vs, variety, value, visual, and vanilla, kind of sums up some things that people can do to make a digital product much more accessible to, to all of their users. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, Judy, if it's okay, I, I'd love to, to ask, you know, for your, your perspective on this and, and from your experience, uh, you, were dis you were discussing already a little bit uh, there about um, what, you've, what, you, what has happened and what, what you've observed, et cetera, in Kenya. Um, it's really intriguing to me, first of all, to hear what you think about uh, about. Uh, your reaction to to the other panelists, but 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 also uh, uh, you know the I I I, I too have observed I, I just you know in in advocacy that I do around things like trade agreements, uh, uh, digital economy trade agreements and things like that. The Kenya really is uh, something of a a, a bellwether, um, and um, the idea that. Um, uh, 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 Kenyan leadership for the African continent that is is, is such an interesting and positive uh, possibility um, uh, you know and, and, and I'm curious about uh, uh, what, what, what 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 you think and um, and uh, the potential you know for for uh, for others others in in not even just in in the region of the African continent where Kenya is but Elsewhere in Africa and beyond to uh, to to follow the example. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, my thought on this would be: what we are lacking is capacity, capacity to accessibility when it comes to the to the industry. Um, in terms of um, yes, we have the policies. Yes, we are. We are leading, but we are stuck with the implementation because um, what exactly does this accessibility mean? It's what what are we supposed to be looking at? Who who in the field knows exactly what is supposed to be happening? So I think um, that is a point that um, that we need to move forward um, within our curriculum. Um, whether you're doing web development, whether you're doing even at the university level, accessibility is not really part of it. So anybody who is um, working on accessibility has been, it has been their own initiative. It's not something that they have, it's part of a coursework that they went to, to do that. And I, I find that, or rather I see that across, across the board. I mean, I was just whispering to, to Matthew, like, there's no closed captionings for those who are in the room because I've noticed that there are, there are those amongst us who are not able to hear. So we've m lost them in most of this conversation since um, the time we started. So I think it's something that should be practiced across the board. We need to understand accessibility from the industry point of view. Thank you. Thanks, much appreciated. Well, uh, I hope, I know Matt has uh, put this into the chat as well, but uh, 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 do welcome welcome any community interventions or questions. I realize as well that we are getting near the end and we are def we are supposed to stay on schedule here. So I, I had a, a great question, I think, <laughs> that I'd like to just open up uh, to any panelists who would like to uh, either briefly or, 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 or expand on uh, their answer um, and, and anyone from the community who might have, have uh, something they'd like to contribute to. But 
uh, kind of getting at solutions, next steps. How can universal design principles for accessibility be uh, advanced across the internet to, to, to improve the experience of those with disabilities? And, and, and what priorities, what changes are needed from an internet gov governance standpoint to accelerate progress? Um, hey, Brian, it looks like we have a question here in the room. If oh, want, wonderful. Like okay. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. My name is Iyasu. I'm based at Addis Ababa University. Uh, so I'm a teacher of the deaf as well. So talking about uh, accessibility of technology, and uh, I've been listening to the presentation, Gunella, and uh, talking about disabilities in general. So my question is specifically to her, but all the panelists. So are there any uh, disability-specific uh, technologies which can be adapted to like a third world in Africa, uh, specifically, for instance, for the deaf people, what are the uh, current, uh, the highest form of technology that can alleviate the communication problems compared to other uh, mobility or any other forms of uh, disability types? So specifically, for the deaf people, what is the highest form of technology that can be adopt adapted to the uh, African uh, countries? Uh, to the deaf people. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Um, it's a good question, and I uh, can't give you an exact exact answer. But uh, certainly, uh, there's a need for more sign language interpreters uh, in every country, and to encourage people who are deaf, as you would be doing through your school. Um, um, for for people to use sign language uh, who are deaf because that is their first language. When it comes to technology, there are um, a number of um, innovations, uh, uh, high technology, which uh, would need probably further work. And I think in the interest of having one minute, um, it's probably not the best time to talk about it, but if you could put your details in the chat, uh, we might be able to continue that uh, conversation. So thank you. Thank, no, thank you for the head. My, my apologies there. I uh, very much appreciate that audience uh, question and uh, 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 there. Um, I do realize that we do have one minute left, but but perhaps we could do a, a rapid fire with the panelists' uh, uh, <laughs> attempt. Uh, maybe if you had to pick pick one particular um, uh, solution that would advance universal design principles for accessibility, uh, a, an internet governance from an internet governance policy standpoint, or otherwise, uh, and. Does anyone have any that really jumped to mind, perhaps? Just thinking about ending on, on some solutions that might get us all uh, motivated and thinking about next steps. Capacity building. Capacity building for both the industry and the persons with disability themselves. Great. I would say equal access to the internet in general, because if you don't have okay. access, if you, you can't even get on to the internet, then all the accessibility in the world doesn't really matter. You've got to have that access and, and the equality of the access up across um, all, all types of people and um, in, you know, throughout the world. Yeah, it's, it's Ricardo here. Um, I totally agree with Betsy. There's uh, even even if you have the best technologies at, at uh, your disposal, unless they are deployed across the country and made available to people, even in remote uh, areas, um, you know, the, the, it, it won't matter how good they are, right? So first of all, you need to have obviously the infrastructure, the deployment of digital. But then obviously you're going to need a ton of, um, of um, capacity building. And this means a change in the culture as well. So unless you want to you wanna get this whole effect to trickle down to the population and people that need it, and talk about education, for example, schools, teachers, um, 
et cetera, and decision makers, you you need to deploy a whole awareness raising campaign and support it also by a, a technical capacity building. So there's several steps that need to be included in a whole policy, I would think. And in that, in that sense, um, uh, as, uh, as Judy mentioned, uh, Kenya is taking uh, very determined steps in, in moving towards the adoption and the deployment of, uh, of accessibility <clears throat> across the country with the, with the adoption of the EN301549 as the standard that I had the pleasure of uh, uh, attending to the, to the event. Uh, back then in, in May. <clears throat> but then uh, again, I think it's very, very important that um, that uh, awareness is uh, is deployed across across the board through government institutions and decision making uh, actors. And I'd like to just follow up and, and agree with uh, with the co uh, comments made by other panelists and uh, and certainly add that um, having accessibility champions in any organization is vital so that it's not forgotten, it's not an afterthought, it's there in, in the center of policy, uh, policy making programs, uh, communications across the board. So once we have that and more persons with disability employed in organizations, so it just becomes it becomes natural that yes how do we accommodate uh, how do we do this it's just part of what we do so um yeah that's that's my final word thank you excellent well uh i really want to thank you all um uh as panelists and and for to the to the uh everyone from the igf community here who participated today it's such a critical topic and I, I, uh, I, I think um, there's some, some great resources being developed you've heard about. There's some very powerful fora that are doing incredible work that, uh, that your perspective would be, is, is, is essential to. And, uh, and, and this is really a, a core tenet of, of, I think, the IGF's mission. So, so, so pleased to be able to participate with everyone here. Uh, really honored. And, uh, and, and thank you all. I hope everyone has a uh, a wonderful uh, rest of uh, rest of your IGF, Matt. I, I would defer to, defer to you. I I, I I cannot. I apologize for this. I can't recall if there's a survey or an evaluation we're supposed to uh, ask people to fill out or something like that. But <laughs> uh, if if so, uh, we can share a link or or maybe just uh, tell people in the room. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a, been a pleasure and a privilege.